views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. This show's audio was via a Skype call. Get fired up for Spirit Fire Radio with your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Get ready to shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in these modern times. Bring purpose to your life through practical spirituality and add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. Now, here are your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Hello, listeners. It is great to be with you for another episode of Spirit Fire Radio. My name is Steve Kramer, and I am joined by my delightful co-host, Dr. Dorothy Riddle. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Steve. Glad to be here. Great to be with you, too. And excited to continue our conversation. We're so lucky. I love these five-week months, right? We, we spent a whole month talking about a different spiritual concept. And this year for Spirit Fire Radio, we're talking about the universe itself and these principles that govern our universe and ways in which we can learn about these various laws and principles and integrate them into our lives so that we can make better choices. We can lead a life that has a greater sense of awareness and consciousness. These are tools, if you will. And so we started this whole series off this month by talking about energy itself, right? The very interesting show, that first show, talking about quantum physics and energy, that everything is indeed energy. And we started off with a quote that's really a favorite of both Dorothy and I, which is that we are not human beings having experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience, which leads us to this, you know, great sort of aha that, well, all of matter, being a human being as a thing is organized energy and that energy follows thoughts. Our mind is very powerful and thoughts become things. So in a sense, we create our own reality, but we can get hung up there. We can get sort of hung up on this idea of our own reality and reality being material, the material world, see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, hear it. Our senses interpret the world around us. And so we often respond to the physical first because it's right in front of us, and especially with people, right? Because we're constantly connected and, and communicating and dealing with other people as we navigate this world. And so often we'll notice the physical details first. You know, I may respond to what do I see first? In most cases, the color of your skin or uh, the yarmulke you're wearing, your lipstick or as we hear in the news lately with this last sort of um, tragedy of a, a shooting, you know, of a black trench coat, are there clues behind this trench coat, this material thing that's a trench coat, or perhaps maybe your New England Patriots cap? We may see somebody coming down the street with a black hoodie up and not be able to see their face and feel fearful. So this physical world, though, it's so much to work with. It can also be a trap because we judge others sometimes by our appearances only. We need to work beyond that. And it just leads to separativeness. So we talked about that as well in the last couple of shows, this idea of you are different than me. And oftentimes that's our reluctance to get beyond the material world, beyond what's right in front of us, to see somebody as much more than their appearance or much more than their garb or even much more than their belief system. And so separativeness, we have said time and time again, Dorothy, right, that it is it is a human heresy, right, separativeness, and we're working so hard to get beyond that. So in talking about interconnectedness this month, we couldn't help but start with separativeness, and, and that that is something we really have to contend with. It is something that is apparent in our world, and it is really, uh, I would say, our mission to mm -hmm. get beyond. So today's show, we're going to talk about being part of an interconnected group. How do we move from this idea of me and you as two separate things to me and you as being together, which would be to form a group? Mm -hmm. Dorothy, do you have some quotes that might start us off after that uh, sort of 
soliloquy? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have a couple uh, that relate to that to the whole idea of how we are interconnected. And I just want to comment: the you know, it's it's interesting to try to put yourself in a place. For me, it's easiest like looking up into the night sky. And remember that you are connected to everything. You are part of everything. We are all part of this huge uh, cosmic energy field. So here's one from uh, Herman Melville. Uh, He writes, We cannot live for ourselves alone. Our lives are connected by a thousand invisible threads, and along these sympathetic fibers, our actions run as causes, and return to us as results. Mm, I thought that that image of going out and coming back is really interesting. Well, and doesn't it also speak a bit of this idea of that we're in this together in that my actions, that, that, that which creates, you know, results affect you. They affect everybody. So That's we have right. to keep it in mind. And I also want to just mention, as you mentioned the stars, you know, doesn't don't we always sort of get this feeling of expansion and wonder and we sort of lose ourselves when we look at the stars and feel that connection to the greater good? It's such a lovely feeling. You'd think everybody mm-hmm. wants to just be laying under the stars every night, right? <laughs> uh, so here's a, here's a second quote, Steve. Uh, this is from Rachel Naomi uh, Remen. The most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen. Just listen. Perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is our attention. A loving silence often has far more power to heal and to connect than the most well-intentioned words. And I love that one because all too often when we're with somebody else, what we're doing really is thinking about the next thing that we're going to say instead of actually listening to what the other person uh, is saying and trying to feel ourselves into their shoes, so to speak. Yeah, and just allowing. You know, I find that listening is this great exercise in allowing, which is also mm-hmm. expansive. Often when we want to yeah. respond right away, it's, it's as if we want to fix something or we want to contain what they just said. And it's such a great exercise to sit back and just listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. And then the final one is from Harriet uh, uh, Golder Lerner, and she writes, only through our connectedness to others can we really know and enhance the self. Only through working on the self can we begin to enhance our connectedness to others. So that's the circle again of, of us and others. And I just wanted to comment, uh, Steve, on the contrast that we've experienced in this last week uh, and how you know, everything that happens affects us, and it may affect us in different ways. But there was that mass shooting at uh, Santa Fe High School. Uh, the ostensible or one of the motivations appears to be uh, – that this person felt rejected, and he he murdered the girl who had uh, said she wouldn't go out with him. But this was uh, this shooting was the 22nd school shooting in 20 weeks. Uh, so we have that horror, you know, and that grief that we experience. And then within a 24-hour period or 36-hour period, we had the wedding of. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, a completely different emotional experience and such an inclusive event. The, I don't know if you were aware, uh, Steve, but they said that her veil, very long uh, veil, had the flowers embroidered on it of every Commonwealth country. And she, oh. cho- she chose to use, you know, her godchildren uh, and other uh, related children as her bridesmaids and pages. So you had these little kids all involved. Um, she walked part of the way down the aisle on her own, and then Prince Charles stepped out and walked with her the rest of the day of, of the way, a very inclusive feeling. It, it was, And then there were all the black musicians, the wonderful cellist, the young black British uh, cellist, uh, so you have that 
that wonderful sense of celebration, wonderful sense of inclusion. And yet, you know, to segue to one of the other topics we wanted to talk about to, together, some of the news today has been focused on what didn't happen. In other words, the glass half empty perspective. Why? Why not just enjoy the event for what it was? Yeah. Um, well, but just a, a few, you know, of course I could go on. <laughs> as I always can. <laughs> but, you know, I, I appreciate that you would bring those up because it is such a stark contrast, this idea that two people are in love and getting married and the entire world celebrates, you know, talk mm -hmm. about being touched by just two people and it being this global event and that there was an American Bishop, you know, the the first black leader of the Episcopal Church, you know, was was preaching about the redemptive mm -hmm. power of love. It was quite something, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I actually had to write down, I had to listen to it several times. And he said, imagine governments and nations where love is the way. He said, imagine this tired old world where love is the way we will actually treat each other like we're actual family, you know, and, mm -hmm. and really bridging, you know, lots of bridging talk. And then this, and and that his mother, or not his that that her mother was sitting right across from from Queen Elizabeth. You know, two people whose whose legacy has such different backgrounds. You know, this black woman of America who was, you know, she grew up. She was a child during the Jim Crow era, where segregation mm -hmm. was was institutionalized, and her her parents were part of the Great Migration. You know, she a descendant of slaves, and that people were talking that Meghan Markle you know, oh, she didn't curtsy for the queen. And then people saying, oh, get over it. But that that you must curtsy for the queen. And that, you know, if someone had curtsied to her mother as a child, they could have gotten reprimanded for actually curtsying to her. You know, so there's mm -hmm. just stark contrast in them sitting straight across from each other. And then the contrast of this, um, you know, young soul who's so lost to be able to take lives of so many people. And as news comes out that that he actually was this very caring, caring person, so they say, and, and took really good care of a, a poor friend of his, bought him lunch all the time. They were so close. And and this is friend just so confused by this and that he was, cap you know, capable of, of murdering people. And. Apparently they're saying today, you know, he was appeared confused and to be that out of touch, you know, with yourself and with others and so disconnected from yourself and others mm -hmm. that you could turn into such a monster or do create such a monstrous crime in contrast mm -hmm. with such connection. It's, it's palpable. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Dorothy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and one of the challenges is, I mean, if we take just the, the one piece of a very complicated um, scenario that that um, being having someone say that she wouldn't go out with him. The, one of our challenges is moving from a, a me-centered world, a sense of entitlement that whatever I want, I should be able to get, to yeah. interconnection, to understanding that this there is truly enough for us all as long as we are moderate and uh, realistic in what it is that uh, that we want, instead and of if, saying if I if I want something, then I should have it. And this thing is a person, you know, right? This, to think if I want this yes. thing, but to see this person as a as a thinking, feeling human being whose response to you is valid, and that says I'd rather not go out with you, and you say I respect that because I I see you. <laughs> it's right. a long journey right. to get to Dorothy. We're already at our first break, so we're. Oh my goodness. I know it's so fast always. We'll be right back after these messages and we'll continue this very important conversation. Glad you're with us, listeners. Hi, I'm Barbara Scheidegger, clinical hypnotherapist and founder of Swiss Hypnotherapy. And this is a tip with purpose. Being wrong or making mistakes is human. What have you learned from it? Start laughing about the silly things you did. Yeah, laugh about it. Being happy is more important than being always right. Start listening to your feedback. Be willing to redefine yourself every day. Communication with yourself and others who already are successful in their lives. 
stay balanced. And when you fall off the wagon, don't dwell on it, just hop back on. Forgive yourself, admit what you did, move on and smile. I hope this tip helps you. You can reach me at 323-999-4775 or at my website at swisshypnotherapy.com. Please join us for a transformational conference with five, that's right, five of the leading pioneers in the fields of science and spirituality, all in one place. Join best-selling authors and teachers, Greg Braden, Dr. Bruce Lipton, Lynn McTaggart, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and Lee Carroll in both individual workshops as well as a weekend of keynote presentations and panel discussions. At this extraordinary event, you'll get to experience some of the brightest leaders of our world today, empowering you with groundbreaking new information, deep wisdom, and practical tools to transform your life. Come connect with others and expand your consciousness in beautiful Nanaimo on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, June 14th through 19th. For more information or to register for what some are expecting to be one of the best conferences of 2018, visit ShalohaProductions.com. That's S-H-A-L-O-H-A Productions.com. Or visit the individual speakers' websites. Conscious Confidence Radio, a timeless wisdom with Sarah Main. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio and join Sarah on an adventurous journey to the deeper level of meaning to move beyond today's world of constant change, confusion, and uncertainty beyond the shadow of fear. This hit show explores key concepts such as confidence, values and attitude in a dynamic way to learn more about sarah and her work visit sarahmain.com stay juicy tune in to your juicy love with me una drake co-hosting monthly with dr pat and every second monday at 12 p.m on transformation talk radio my show your juicy love helps you find the dynamic life-affirming love you've always wanted Transform your relationships and bring peace, joy, and juicy, juicy love to planet Earth. For more information, visit unadrake.com. Welcome back, listeners, to Spirit Fire Radio. I'm joined with my co-host, Dr. Dorothy Riddle. And before we continue our conversation about interconnectedness and being a part of a group, you know, how, how do you become part of an interconnected group? Uh, I'd love to tell you a little bit about our groups. Uh, both of us represent uh, educational nonprofit organizations, and this is a creative collaboration between those two organizations. And uh, we'd love for you to hear about them. Dorothy, do you mind if I just start off quick? Go right ahead. Perfect. So I'm here representing Spirit Fire, which is an educational nonprofit, and it is our mission to cultivate consciousness and educate people on ways that they can bring spirituality into their everyday lives. We do that primarily with the practice of living awareness, which is our online meditation practice. It's totally free. You can go to spiritfire.com and find out more about our online education programs, that very awesome meditation program and meditation retreats. We have a retreat center in Western Mass. And so uh, look us up. And Dorothy is with the School for Esoteric Studies. Dorothy, a bit about your awesome organization. Yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, the School for Esoteric Studies focuses on providing training and support to persons who have a spiritual practice that they want to deepen. Um, we uh, do that through study, meditation, and service. And we have a website at esotericstudies.net. At the present time, we, are, uh, we have what we call the Subjective Group Conference, which is a period of the three linked festivals of Aries, Taurus, and Gemini. Uh, when we look uh, very deeply at a particular topic, this year we're looking at the science of invocation and evocation. And if you're interested in joining us in that process. The Festival of Goodwill is coming up. Please see more information on our website at esotericstudies.net. Mm. So I love those words, right? Invocation and evocation. What do we what do we allow in and what do we put out? It's the That's basis, right. right? All exchange. 
Absolutely, and it is critical. We we are responsible for our own energy, and that is how we contribute to a group. If we yep. put out negative energy, then that's uh, we're going to kind of sour the environment of the group. If we put out loving energy, then we help strengthen and uphold the group. And so I know I've said this on this program before, but I think of it as our being responsible for any psychic pollution we might create Mm -hmm. if we generate damaging or harmful energy. Yes. So So one of the ways that we do that, Steve, is through this whole idea that more is better, right? The the kind of greed that comes with that and and, uh, focusing on on the physical material world, as you talked about before, Instead of uh, a philosophy of less is more, you know, small is beautiful, voluntary simplicity, downshifting, all of these other ideas. And the, the original definition of wealth, which I think can help us focus in that direction, is happiness, well-being, and joy. It's not about money. Oh, <laughs> hasn't that become warped, right? I don't know that anyone yes. would, would equate those, except they all think when they're happier, they're going to make more money. Or they're gonna, when they make more money, they're going to be happier. But uh, yeah, money somehow got thrust into that uh, definition, right? Mm-hmm. And it actually, really- the research doesn't, doesn't uh, show that. It does not show that people are happier the wealthier they are. It, it, uh, it doesn't at all. I've actually been... Uh, I've been reading quite a bit of the Dalai Lama lately and, and uh, there was a great quote. I've been reading a lot of on happiness and, and he was talking about the material world and wealth. And I have a quote right here that I think is, is, is so apropos. He says, if unwanted suffering can be removed and happiness achieved merely through material advancement and wealth, then rich people should be free from suffering. But obviously this is not the case. In fact, once people obtain a good bit of money, comfort, and power, they tend to become excessively proud and jealous, particularly covetous, focused on harm, and increasingly apprehensive. Those that live in a moderate way are by no means impervious to the three poisons of lust, hatred, and ignorance, but for the most part, they're bothered considerably less by additional problems. And you know, we, see, we, we hear time and time again when they do these happiness indexes, it's usually people that live in socialized, either socialized uh, um, cultures or that live in extreme poverty or extreme simplicity in that they live very rudimentary, close to the earth um, mm-hmm. existences, like almost nomadic existence, existences where you know tribal culture or community is very important. So we see once again this idea of separativeness of me and what I have and mine creates separation. It creates suffering. You want more once you've got a little, if you see that it's only yours. But as soon as it's shared, as soon as we realize we're responsible for each other, there's a happiness index. It goes up. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it means focusing on what we have, not on, not on what we don't have, right? Being mm-hmm. appreciative, being grateful for what for everything that we that we do get. And and for me, that, that practice of gratitude is, is uh, so rewarding. You know, if I notice every single time something happens or so, someone does something for me that is helpful, and I thank them for that, uh, and I say something like, you know, you made my day. This is really wonderful. I feel so much better. Yeah. Don't you get that yeah. feeling? Yeah. And you feel a part. You feel a part of that experience. That it wasn't just for you, but there's there's a lovely exchange. And you know what you were saying earlier about like small is beautiful and and simplicity and sort of downshifting. Their appreciation goes with that because you know if I heard somebody and I don't remember who it was talking about appreciation and they 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 were sort of asking the listeners to really ponder what is appreciation and what what creates appreciation. When we are appreciative, what is happening? And they said, what it means is there is more added to it. 
So if you are appreciating that someone handed you the groceries in it or packed your groceries for you, you know, I'm so appreciative when someone fits everything in one bag and it's all nice and neat and they've put the herbs on top and they're not crushing them with a can. And and I, I say, thank you. That's such a beautiful, you know, you did such a wonderful job packing that. I really appreciate it. It is more time together. It is more. There is a, there is more of an awareness. There is just simply more. When we appreciate a flower, we're giving more time to it, more connection, creating a greater resonance between us and the flower or us and the person. And so it becomes expansive in nature. And I think that's why gratitude and appreciation feel so good because it is a principle that the universe is expansive in nature. It's constantly growing and expanding. So in my thinking, you're being aligned with the universe when you're being appreciative and grateful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it is worth noting that the opposite of appreciation is criticism. Mm. And in fact, in the esoteric teachings, the, the thing that, uh, that disciples are chided for is criticism, right? Don't spend your time looking at somebody else and thinking of what they ought to be doing. Spend your time looking at yourself and what you're doing and what you're contributing or what you could be contributing. Now, if somebody asks me for feedback because they need uh, they need that input, and I then observe them and provide them with feedback, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the constant wearing down of you should have, uh, why didn't you? Those kinds of comments. Well, and in the case of them asking you, you can sense and feel into that that it's then a part of a creative process. It's cooperative. Whereas criticism mm -hmm. puts a wall up immediately, it's separative mm -hmm. right away. You know, that just be, creates a barrier and something you have to react to. You know, there's mm -hmm. instantaneously a reaction against. We would, some would think, unless you were really wise and you just thought, oh, I'm sorry you're criticizing me. You know, I was that way once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I well. of, a, of of sporting events, you know, in that, it creates such an us versus them scenario. You know, gosh, I just read that they're they're building a four and they say it might approach five billion dollar stadium in Los Angeles for the Rams. I guess I didn't know I'm probably totally wrong. I don't know anything about sports teams, but mm. a stadium, a, a football stadium, five billion dollars. And you just go, wow, when you think about then to for that to happen, how much money this is generating, it's kind of crazy, but that just goes to show how important it is to us as a culture. And it is so competitive. You know, it's immediately your team versus my team and people get hurt. So there's, you know, that aspect, but imagine if we had sporting events where there really wasn't a winner, that it was just about being, having fun or being inspiring or, or a valuable experience, you know, where it was just like, oh, wow, that was really interesting. Or even, you know, I learned something from you, the way you, you know, treated that, responded to that play. Imagine if we approach sports in that way where no one really won, but it was just about the experience. Goodness, we would really be on our way to a, a holistic view of humanity and life on this planet. Good luck with that, right, Dorothy? <laughs> well, I think I think the concept of one's personal best is trying to head in that direction, mm. and it you know the the thing is how how do you view it? Do you view it as uh, because I have uh, I have a sister who is an athlete, and you know for her at least my assumption is observing her. That uh, that when she competes with others who are really really good, it's exciting for her. It's like you know, how well can I do? It 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 calls out to her. Now the parallel experience that I have to this is, um, I used to when I was in college. Part of how I supported myself was as an accompanist, you know, playing the piano for uh, musicians and singers. And I was in a situation once where I had been accompanying this cellist uh, during her practice uh, periods, and I uh, I went with her to a lesson, and her teacher was an absolutely superb cellist. And so he was demonstrating to her how she should play a particular passage, and he wanted me 
to accompany him. I mean, that would be the logical thing to do. It was so demanding. You know, accompanying him was a, was like qualitatively different than accompanying somebody at a less, lesser level of skill. It was it was just breathtaking. It was a marvelous experience. So I think there is something about you know developing a skill to a very high level that yeah. is uh, you know it's part of what we contribute to the common good. So I, I don't want us to take that out of the equation. It's the when it's the I'm better than you and you're nothing. It's that kind of competition that's the problem. Well, and it also brings it back in my mind to cooperation uh, versus competitiveness. Like I'm hearing both with both of them. It's sort of cooperating with the process and aspiring to better oneself, to be a part of the creative field. You know, I'm hearing that in there. Dorothy, we're at the halftime. (laughs) Speaking of sports. So we're going to go to a break and we'll be right back after these messages. To find answers to life's questions, you need to look within yourself. Dr. Glenna Rice brings your questionable conversations on Transformation Talk Radio each month. Tune in each month for insight into how you can live up to your full potential. Dr. Glenna is a physical therapist, certified access consciousness, and access body class facilitator. How does it get any better than this? For more information on Dr. Glenna Rice and her work, visit GlennaRice.com. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called to do something that we so not thought was in our real house to do for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on the Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at the com. Love Living Radio Ignite Your Whole Being with Emily Perkins is a show for those looking to explore the sparkling magnificence of their inner selves. Tune in every second and fourth Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific as Emily sheds a radiant light of love on the beauty and power that resides within you. Discussing love in all its forms through conversations that provoke awareness, curiosity, and expansion, Emily shares the unlimited power of love. For more information or to listen to this show, visit lovelivingholistics.com. Practice living in wholeness with the body tune-up. Six classes for $89 designed for radical self-healing and self-regeneration. Heal the deepest root of any challenge. The mental body was programmed in negativity, not good enough, separate from source. You're too much. You'll never make it. The emotional body holds all the pain and trauma of emotional suppression, all the pain from this life and life's past. The spiritual body is the place you connect with your higher power, your higher self, with the image and likeness of the one. The physical body houses and expresses the other three bodies every day. Go to CorneliaStephanie.com. Evolve, become a practitioner. We need to heal, integrate, and bring into wholeness and harmony the physical body, addressing all the other bodies in order to live in our true, authentic nature. Living Lighter Radio with Jason and Patricia. We have an ecosystem approach to your life. Tune in weekly every Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio as we, Jason and Patricia, discuss what's truly holding you back. We offer you the tools you need to reach your goals and at the same time be living lighter. For more information about living lighter, visit www.livinglighter.org. Hello, listeners. Welcome back. We are going to continue our conversation on interconnectedness. So the dynamics of interconnectedness. Dorothy, a few words? Yeah. The Well, we've alluded to some of this, but I think it's it's helpful to focus on them specifically. Of course, one of the main ones is inclusion, you know, feeling valued for who you are, um, feeling a sense of rapport, of connection to others. Um, 
whether or not you agree with them. And I think that's one of the really important things. That, and there are techniques that people use, like appreciative inquiry, you know, where you really listen to where someone else is coming from and why a different perspective is important to them. Uh, and that creates this feeling of inclusion. So I just want to underscore that because inclusion doesn't mean that we're all identical twins. It means that we feel uh, that dynamic of connection and of, uh, of caring for each other. Yeah, that, that whole challenge of, of learning to agree to disagree. You know, can you find a connection with someone who might not have the same sort of ideas as you? Or, you know, especially these days with such polarizing politics, you know, you find yourself in a group of people and it gets heated. This idea of just allowing somebody to have their own beliefs. Sometimes I find it helpful to ask why they believe what they believe. It allows them to sort of go deeper and sort of talk a bit about their values. And I find that once we connect, we can sort of respect somebody more when we know their value system and we can sort of just at least see where they're coming from. At least we're part of the process, right? Mm -hmm. of, well, of and that's, that's another one of the dynamics that you just named, which is respect. You know, seeing the other, not seeing what you want to see, but see them as they actually are. Or people talk about, you know, walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. Uh, really, um, whether they, whether you agree with them or not, uh, recognizing that they are part of the divine. Yeah, or just finding even a few qualities you like about someone, I always find helps. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just that, yeah. that idea. Namaste, which is, I see the light in you, is to find something that's lighted about somebody, even if you, if you might not, you know, want to, you know, spend a lot of time with the whole package, there's something that, you know, you find that, that you appreciate. Again, appreciation goes a long way and respecting for them for who they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another, another uh, dynamic that is really important that we don't we've talked about on this show, but we don't often think about in general, is mental control, you know, the ability to maintain a mental focus and to screen out random distractions. The quote they talked about listening to somebody, you know, draws on this the, uh, so that we are able to be present with other people. Of course, an aspect of that is to make sure that we uh, we, we use the energy that we control in an ethical manner because it is possible to pressure other people uh, to try, you know, try to get them on our side or to see our point of view um, rather than, just, than being with them. Yeah, yes. You know, one of my one of my friends is in the corporate world, and and there's been a bit of a, a shakeup, as often happens in the corporate world, right? And and she's constantly having to sort of maintain composure, and and door and and sort of, I'm always asking her, just rise to the observer, you know, just can you just observe, just try to observe, and it's that control, you know, when we can lift to the mental plain, you know, when we can just allow ourselves to see the big picture, even see the group from above, it can help, you know, once we get into our emotions, oh, it can be a little bit tricky. And Dorothy, I know, you know, you've been in your lifetime, you've been in so many round tables, um, you know, really working for the betterment of mankind. I mean, of human, oh, mankind, there, I did it. <laughs> of, of humanity. I know you've been so good at having me, of catching me, of, of I, my, allowing me to catch myself <laughs> time and time again when I oh. use these phrases that don't serve. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure that you, there are so many times that, that you've had to sort of stay on that mental plane, you know, to just see the big picture. You're working toward the big picture and not get too caught up in the details because you've done quite a bit of work on, on, on the humanitarian scale where I'm sure there are lots of different ideas coming forward and having to negotiate and having to sort of find a solution to very difficult problems, right? Yeah, and I to me to me the, the the issue is to always want the best possible outcome, yeah. and it may be 
something different than what I've visualized. But taking myself out of it, my own self-interest out of it. But you know, what is really going to work the best for everyone? There's an image that was given to me by a family friend years ago that I found very helpful, which is if you're, you know, if you're trying to work out a, a solution to a problem, to think of the problem as like being on a table and we're all sitting around the table looking at it, you know, and putting out energy for the best outcome. So it's not, it's not my outcome or your outcome. It's the group's outcome, the common good. And so that's an interesting that you would choose uh, to say the word control because some people might default to, well, I would like to control what's happening here, but it's not that at all. It's really releasing control and allowing one, yourself to sort of be in the flow of this sort of, as you say, the best possible outcome. And even though, even if it's you or somebody at the table, you can sense that, ah, they've got the best idea. And I can see that that idea would take this situation the furthest, but unless the group is there, there might be another option that might have to come first so that everybody as a group can face together. You know, that's real creative co-creative, uh, you know, the capacity that's innate to us and cooperation. And as you say, it takes quite a control of our mental, emotional uh, facilities, right? Yeah. So it's interesting because we're using control in slightly different ways, right? Yes, exactly. I'm not controlling the process in the sense of forcing a particular end. What I'm controlling is my contribution, Self. my energy, right? Yes. Yeah. That I am not forcing others in my direction, that I'm not dismissing things, but I'm rather building on. And it, it's interesting because in the community where I live, there have been uh, there have been several extremely contentious issues. And what I've noticed, a friend pointed this out to me, what I've noticed is that if I make an intervention that calls into question, you know, what the powers that be might want to do, they react to that and they forget that what I add is always here is another possible way. And it's, it's something I've been thinking about, how, how to help people uh, not get stuck on the, uh, on the first part of the message that yeah. actually, you know, Let's look at something else and then consider this other option, which may not itself be the ultimate best option, but it's part of the picture. It's like a puzzle that we're all putting together instead of saying it's my solution. Yeah, you know? yeah it requires... That's, a, that's an interesting image, Steve. You yeah. know, if we think of it as a done deal, you know, it's a picture framed, sealed, delivered versus it's a puzzle that we each have pieces of and we need to work together to put them together to make the best picture. And the beautiful thing is there's no boundaries to that puzzle. It will constantly expand and get bigger. It's just this process of filling in the holes together, you know, and allowing the picture to get bigger and expand and expand. It's just one big creative process. But wow, we get so stuck, right? It's that thing again, we get tripped up on what's right in front of us. You know, it's, it's this idea of just staying open, right? Just staying open. And flexible, which which brings me to another aspect, uh, another dynamic of uh, of interconnectivity, which is affection and openness, the willingness to engage with other people, and we can think of that as the affective twin to the mental aspect of inclusion, right? That affection, that being present uh, with somebody else. Mm. Yes. Affection reminds me, you know, appreciation and affection are very closely related, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's another aspect that it's a little bit different, and that's the whole balance between unique and interconnected. Uh, because sometimes we think, well, if we're all interconnected, then we all meld, right? We lose our individuality. But actually, we each have our own soul's purpose. We each have a unique piece to play or a, or a unique piece of the puzzle. And so how is it that we maintain that sense of our own self
ourself, our own uniqueness, without thinking that we're better than somebody else. You know, but we are unique and connected at the same time. Or that somebody has to be just like us or else. You know, again, it's that, right. you know, right. versus. It's that versus rather than, than and. I like to think of it as facets of the diamond, you know, that we're all mm-hmm. facets of the diamond. And at any given time, the light's going to catch a different facet and it's going to shine. And to appreciate somebody else's facet shining every now and again, knowing that it will turn, you know, everything turns to everything, turn, mm-hmm. turn, turn, right? And it's something <laughs> like your facet will shine and it will be a time for you to be appreciated. So really just allowing, you know, that this idea of, of expand and include. I love that that concept of just allowing allowing everybody to be and realize we're all part, you know, of of the bigger. Dorothy, I want to I want to continue this conversation because that's that's such a, about uniqueness and, and interconnectedness, and I know you do too because it's it's so interesting, you know, to be unique but yet feel a part of the greater whole. That's such the that's such the challenge, um, and it can that can seem like they're two forces against each other, but really they work so well together. We're at a break, and um, after this message, we'll come back and continue that uniqueness and interconnectedness. Hi, I'm Barbara Scheidegger, clinical hypnotherapist and founder of Swiss Hypnotherapy. My goal is to help you to reach your goal. And this is a tip with purpose. Everybody wants it and nobody has enough of it. But it comes to a point that you have to tell yourself, I can get more. I want more. I deserve more. I'm talking about money. More money, more money, more money. That's what people want. But what has to be done? Your thoughts have to change. That you can allow yourself to tell yourself, I have money and I want more money. How much money? What is it? Put it out there. Write it down. What would you do with more money? How would you feel to have more money? I hope this tip helps you going through the day today. You can reach me at 323-999-4775 or at my website at swisshypnotherapy.com. Are you your story? Or can you change your story? Can you change what you believe to be true about yourself and your circumstances as part of your healing journey? What if you were to change your expectations? What if you were to invite ease and cooperation into every day and then step back and see what happens? It might just be easier. I'm Megan Edge, and I hope that you'll join me on my new radio show, playing on the edge, radical change with ease, with my co-host, Dr. Pat, on Transformation Talk Radio. I look forward to seeing you there. Want to find out more about Megan Edge? Visit her website at meganedge.ca. Hi, I'm Steve Kramer of Spirit Fire Radio, and I believe that meditation changes everything. It leads us in the direction of greater well-being, and that's a fact. I struggled with meditation for years. I understood the principles, but I found it hard to incorporate them into my everyday life. Spirit Fire's meditation practice changed that. It's called the Practice of Living Awareness, and it's taught in 14 steps. These are 14 tools that I can use in any moment, on and off the cushion. Steps like smile, flow, and ground of being support my clarity of mind while I'm navigating the ups and downs of modern life. That's why it's called the Practice of Living Awareness. If you'd like to add meditation to your daily experience, the Practice of Living Awareness is free, online, and it's suited for any level of practitioner. Visit spiritfire.com for more information. And be sure to check out Spirit Fire's meditation retreats in Western Massachusetts. It's all there at spiritfire.com. Welcome back, listeners. We are continuing this week's discussion on group and interconnectedness. Dorothy, would you like to continue the conversation? Yeah, I, one of the images that's always helped me 
on on this deed is to think about my body. Uh, the different, you know, we have the cells, and they go together into organs that have very specialized functions. I mean, the liver is different from the heart, is different from the kidneys, uh, and yet they're all part of the body. They all have to function together. They all have to to work together. They're part of that whole. And there's a quote from Lynn Margulis, a, a biologist that I really love, that I'd like to share. Uh, she writes, we evolved ultimately from the first bacteria. A major theme of the microbial drama is the emergence of individuality from the community interactions of once independent actors. The tendency of independent life is to bind together and reemerge in a new wholeness at a higher, larger level of organization. So it's so we have this, you know, this independence, interdependence, independence, interdependence uh, flow going on, uh, or we can think of it like the Russian doll, right? Of the the little. Uh, the, the little dolls that are each inside each other, each by themselves are their own unique self, but they're part of that larger whole. Mm, I, I used to love those dolls and, and, and even just that in order for one to fit in the next, they had to be a little bit different shape. And as they expanded, they were similar, but not so much. You could sense the mm-hmm. ways in which each one was a little bit different to contain all that was within it. And uh, mm-hmm. indeed, you know, as you start to, realize that there is this container and that container has a container and that container has a container. And we can see that in our material world and realize that, well, it's all fractal and (laughs) that really it just has to expand that we are a part of a container and we are right. Dorothy, I mean, we are, we are a part of this earth. We are a part of this solar system. This solar system is a part of a galaxy and they all have the same shape. I mean, you could look at the shape of an atom. You could look at the shape of a cell, a shape, the shape of the earth, the shape of the solar. It's all the same shape and all a container. So you really realize we've just got to get it together to realize we are just a part of this greater whole. Yep. Mm -hmm. But yet existing, as we were talking about uniqueness and interconnectedness, you know, we, we are, we are separate, but equal, (laughs) you know, and we, we really have our own experience within this sort of sphere, you know, within this sheath that is either the planet earth or is our personality, uh, that is this incarnation. I think of, you know, when, when we're a little baby and we are, uh, All of our needs are taken care of and we feel a part of our mother's life. I mean, we don't have to think beyond her because all of our needs are met by her. You know, we're kept warm, we're fed, we're loved. And then there comes that time where we're separated, you know, and we have to start thinking for ourselves like the terrible twos. And we say, no, or I don't want that. We start to stand on our own and we start to establish this idea that I'm separate. And then it becomes this life process of working your way back to realizing you are a part of something bigger. You know, I think it's really our 30s and 40s and maybe even to our 50s and 60s where we really find that we are able to be cooperative in such a meaningful way as a as a, a, a greater whole. It's this dependence as a child to independence in middle life and then interdependence, we would hope, as we get older. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or it can even happen earlier than that. Yeah. <laughs> right? it we don't, it's, we don't it's, have to wait until we're older. Uh, sure. But you know what? What's reassuring to me is that there are there are initiatives that are trying to move us towards this uh, this awareness of our interconnection. It's not so much making us interconnected because we already are, but but yeah. raising that awareness. So we have things like the UN Mil- uh, Millennium Development Goals, you know, which is focused on collective well-being. Now, whether we're getting there or not uh, is another matter, but at least it's something to aim for. And, and listen, then we have Dorothy. I yep. just just a, a side note because that is amazing. When you look at those Millennium Goals, anyone who hasn't seen them, to read them and really ponder them, ponder the impact. You become so inspired. You feel a part of this striving. Uh, just you feel a part of of the human experience and this human hopefully you are inspired in a way that makes you feel like you would love to see a world that looks like this that operates this way so 
you know, really it's worth looking up that the the UN Millennium Development Goals, indeed. And also the the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if you haven't read that. Yeah, that yeah. was Incredible. that's a common statement, yeah. That uh, something to strive towards. The uh, the OECD uh, uh, started uh, focusing on the whole concept of well-being, and Canada was the first country to come up with an index of well-being. And I think, Steve, it's interesting to note what's part of that index because so often, again, we think of the material, and certainly a good good living standard is part of it. But the other pieces are robust health a sustainable environment, vital communities, an educated population, balanced time use, Goodness. high levels of civic participation, uh, access to and participation in dynamic arts, culture, and recreation. Right? So it's much more Canada. than <laughs> the material. But, yeah, I mean, but, but when, it, when I hear those, I mean, wow. You know, balanced time use, you think we're just yeah. not well as a culture these days, you know, and even dynamic, did you say dynamic arts and, and yes, culture yeah, participation in dynamic arts and culture and recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And does Canada, I mean, is that, is, is that where a person is, is scored on that index of well-being? Um, is, I think it's focused more on communities. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yep. Well, are they doing? Uh, it? But it's oh. it's still a new enough concept that you know if you walk down the street and ask you know the random Canadian, I'm not sure that they could tell you anything about the index of well-being. <laughs> but it's there as a goal, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, Wonderful goal. Educated populace. I love that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we have Bhutan, you know, who's replaced the gross domestic product, which is the economic index with the Gross National Happiness Index. Mm. Which I think that's just such a wonderful concept. Nice. I also think of these group meditation in initiatives that are happening. You know, there are the, tri the triangle initiative that goes on. And, mm -hmm. and I even think of people's experience here at the, at the retreat center, at the meditation center. When they experience group meditation, they really walk out of it if they've never experienced it before and say, that was really incredible, you know, to tap into a group energy, to connect meditatively, it's, it's palpable. And, you know, the one I was thinking of, too, is the Nobel Peace Prize and Nobel laureates, mm -hmm. you know, just to look at, uh, at, at some of the recipients and, and, and ways that they've contributed in the world they'd like to see, you know, being an example of the world they'd like to see is always inspiring uh, for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dorothy, and we're then just... We have the, oh, I oh, just oh, have to mention this last one. Day. The Global global Coherence Initiative, Heart Coherence, which I think is really an interesting. And what is that? Um, it's, it was started by the Heart Math Institute, uh, and it's a whole initiative about leveraging the coherence of the end of the waves of the heart the beating of the heart the cosmic pulse oh and working it's towards establishing a coherence globally mm -hmm. wow absolutely beautiful. lovely to think that you know there are these fine examples we see, we hear and see of so many examples these days that do not express that we need to focus and and allow space for um, reminding ourselves of those uh, ways in which we do see collaboration and cooperation and interconnectivity. So Dorothy, that's a great conversation. I'm so pleased uh, that we had this time. And listeners, I hope you'll join us next week. We're going to talk about managing interconnectedness. So you want this to be a part of your life, but how do you navigate the group experience? You know, how, how do you manage that within your life to make yourself effective within the group and the group effective within the greater whole? So we hope you'll join us. And in the meantime, spiritfire.com and school for esoteric, you say it, Dorothy. <laughs> school for esoteric studies at esotericstudies.net. Esotericstudies.net. And spiritfire.com, on behalf of the both of us, thank you for joining us. It's been great, Dorothy. We'll speak next week. Yep. Yep. Look forward to no. it.
Bye. Thank you for listening to Spirit Fire Radio. Tune in each Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern for your weekly guide to purposeful living and practical spirituality. Join hosts Steve Kramer and Dorothy Riddle as they shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in your everyday life. Add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. To learn more, visit spiritfireradio.com. 